Welcome to the study of God's Word with Pastor Steve Wiseman, recorded live from Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at peewevalleybaptistchurch.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to begin a special study titled, Developing Spiritual Depth. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. We're going to begin a series today uh, called Developing Spiritual Depth. Developing Spiritual Depth, otherwise known as spiritual maturity. And um, it should be, uh, for all those who have been saved by the grace of God, it should be our heartfelt desire to continue to grow and deepen uh, our, our faith through the Word of God. So we're going to read Mark chapter 8. Stand if you're able. If you're not, you can remain seated, of course. And we'll read verses 34 to 38. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Father, guide us through your truth today. Teach us through the power of the Holy Spirit as we give our attention uh, undistracted to your word. May we be focused upon that which you give to us and your word as it is the truth. And we'll give you praise and thanks for the work that you'll do in our hearts For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. So in this study, we're going to talk about, uh, continue to develop our spiritual maturity and to deepen our relationship with God in the process. Uh, So I want to start out, I think it's the right thing to do when we talk about this, is to start out talking about priorities. Priorities. So today, uh, we're going to, Um, address this topic, embrace the right priorities. Embrace the right priorities. And so what are priorities? What are priorities? Believe it or not, whether we consciously think about it or not, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, we establish priorities in our life on a continuous basis. Uh, everything we say, everything we do, everything we think is based on priorities that we have established in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, and, and so when, uh, when we're presented the Word of God, it is not natural to be able to understand it. It cannot be understood naturally. It requires one who is spiritual to be able to understand it. The Lord uses his word to bring people to him and the Lord uses his word to teach and instruct and guide us into depth of spiritual maturity as he desires and that's an obligation that we have it's not a not a choice or a an option that we have it's a mandate from God that we grow continue to grow spiritually so I just wrote down a couple of things priorities are things that to us are superior in rank or position. Uh, and I give you a good example. If you, if you were to have in your past met somebody notable, uh, it's something that uh, you tend to remember. And in the presence of other people, you speak of uh, perhaps oftentimes of having met somebody that's notable. Uh, and it's a natural thing for us to do. 
Uh, and so getting into a conversation, somebody talks about how they met somebody important. Uh, it triggers that thought. And we come into the conversation and say, well, guess who I met on such and such an occasion and who it was. Um, but are we as equally happy and ready to share who really makes a difference in our life? It's Almighty God. There's nobody that can compare. There's nobody that can compare. Christ Jesus went to the cross, paid the price for our sins through a sacrificial death, being the sacrificial Lamb of God without blemish, sinless and per perfect in every way. <clears throat> uh, when the Bible says that there's no, there's no one that's perfect, <clears throat> no one without sin, Christ is accepted because He was without sin. So the Scripture talks about people. We're, but He was fully God, and yet fully man. <clears throat> we'll quickly talk about somebody that we've met, and we hesitate. That's when we talk about priorities. We will hesitate about the most important person we've ever known, and that's Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a wrong priority. That's a wrong priority. To not have Christ first. I told you about the person had a business card, handed it to me one time. It was such a, it was such a stark statement of witness and testimony. Handed me a business card, and I looked at it, and I said, your name's not on here. He says, yeah. He said, the most important person that walked the earth, his name is on there, and his name is Christ Jesus, and he talked about him. And it's like, amen, okay? But, and I still don't know the person's name to this day. Because <clears throat> it didn't matter to him that I knew his name, what mattered to him is I would know the name of Christ. <clears throat> we don't have the right priorities sometimes. We talk about many things that are important to us. And the most important thing that happened to us is the free gift of salvation through faith in Christ. The most important thing. It happened by the grace of God. We're not worthy of it. And yet that doesn't come as a priority in our everyday life. It almost takes a special occasion. We almost have to wait until we're sure it's safe to tell somebody about Jesus or that we are a Christian. Because it's not safe in many circles today. Uh, <clears throat> all you got to do is get in the, the wrong crowds in some of these violent cities and tell somebody about Christ and you're liable to find yourself dead. Uh, literally, those things are happening today in our country, much less around the world but also things that take a, a, a priority in life are things that we prefer, things that we prefer. <clears throat> and things that are of the highest value to us, relatively high value. <clears throat> so if somebody were to come up to you and say, uh, what's, what's, what is it, you know, somebody you don't know, or maybe somebody you know, maybe they're not a believer, says, what's really important to you? Uh, you say, well, you know, financial security of my family, and so I believe my career is very important. Who would we leave out? The most important thing, and we had to think about something to say, it ought to come right off the tip of the tongue. My highest priority is Christ Jesus. Because the Word is Christ, right? Christ, the flesh, uh, became the Word. So <clears throat> another way to look at it is... Um, what is it that takes up our time and attention? Our time and attention. Usually the things that we give the most time and attention to and give the most serious thought and consideration to are the things that are most important to us. Christ is, should be, to every believer, most important. And that's what the Scripture is telling us. And we studied that long ago. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Uh, set your affection on the things above, not the things on earth. We know that Christ is the highest priority for every believer, but yet we don't live our life like that. So knowing something is one thing, but applying what you know and using it is another thing. And oftentimes we, we, get, we get the priorities wrong. So the things that really demand our careful attention, if you will, and focus are those things that are very important to us and take priority. 
So uh, here's um, things that we prefer, priorities that are not righteous, are things that we prefer over the Lord <clears throat> uh, in worshiping Him, praising Him, praying, if you will, witness and testimony, Bible study uh, as well. So, um, you know, even in the Old Testament, because there's a word called the first fruits. You know, in the Old Testament, they had to make sacrifices. And uh, when they sacrificed an animal, they were to take the best of the animals and sacrifice the animal. You sacrifice the animal. Uh, <clears throat> the natural tendency, I believe today, if there was a... And, and we're, not, we're not sacrificing animals today because Christ paid the price. He became the precious Lamb of God for us. So we don't sacrifice animals. We put faith in the one who paid the price for our sins. But if we were to be sacrificing animals today, we'd look over and say, oh, that little weakling over there. That's the one I'll offer up. I'm not going to offer up. The... God wants the very best. He wants the very best of what we have to offer. So they offered up the best of the sheep, if you will, for sacrifice. They offered up the first fruits. We might think, well, I'm going to take what I want and then I'll share the other stuff. But no, first priority. Priorities have to come into focus for us. And I mentioned seeking first the kingdom of God. First means top priority to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. First priority over in Colossians chapter 3 in the first few verses is to set our affection on the things above, not on the things of earth. Set our affection there. Romans chapter 12 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be conformed, I mean, be conformed to the word of God. But don't be conformed to the world. It's a priority. <clears throat> but our life naturally lived will conform to with the world, naturally live. We have to consciously be aware not to be conformed to the world. That's why the scripture talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2, the renewing of the mind. We gotta think differently. We gotta think, you can't think like we used to think because it was just natural. It's natural for us still to just go the ways of the world. We have to constantly do what? According to the scriptures, uh, Peter said it well, it says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But the, the thing that we have to do as our priority is resist the devil. When we resist him, he'll flee from us if it's a priority for us. And um, <clears throat> uh, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I hear so many people today say, and you know, we, it's not about keeping commandments today. It's not about keeping commandments. That's Old Testament stuff. You know, there's tons of commandments in the New Testament. Tons of commandments in the New Testament. And we're commanded to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We found that over in Deuteronomy. We're to, we're to love the Lord with all that we have. It's because He's the top priority, even above our family. We say, well, nothing gets closer than blood family. Oh, yes. For a believer, Christ Jesus, our Lord, is first priority. So, <clears throat> um, I want to talk about the first point here, but I want to talk about priorities first. Because uh, that's really what this study is going to be about. If we're going to develop spiritual depth, we're going to have to make sure we have our priorities right. And so I want us to set the stage for priorities. But here in Mark chapter 8 <clears throat> and verse um, 34, Jesus called his disciples and a bunch of interested people came along too. It says that when he had called the people, <clears throat> and the people are not his disciples, people who were amazed at his miracles and thought him to be a spectacle, those who uh, heard about his healing power, maybe witnessed it. And it was almost like a circus show to them to some extent because it was like a spectacle. Here's this guy and he can do all of these things. Uh, and pretty important things if, you, uh, if you're sick and he heals you, right? So he called all these people together and his disciples also. 
And so this message was given not just to believers or those who had uh, been following Christ through faith, uh, but those who were not um, uh, of faith, perhaps were following him, interested in him, somehow tagging along with him. So he called all the people together. And he gave this very important message to all those people. And it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew as well. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. A pretty simple statement, but it is packed. Packed with priorities. Packed with priorities. And a key word in this verse is the first one. Whosoever. Doesn't matter who you are. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Aren't you glad you're a whosoever? Amen. Good to be in that kind of a crowd, right? Well, we're the target of God's love. It's not God's will that any would perish, but all would come to repentance and all would turn from sin. But not everybody will. Matthew chapter 7 tells us over in verses 13 and 14 that there are going to be few that are going to find it. There's only going to be few on that path of righteousness. The majority of the world is going to go their own way and live the ways of the world. And they're going to end up in a fiery pit that we call hell. But he talks to people here and he talks to them in this sense. And whosoever will come after me. There's a comma there so we can take a pause. Whosoever will come after me. Um, Come uh, takes upon itself in the context here as a top priority. It's a top priority. Whosoever shall, shall come after me and follow me um, and uh, those are, only those are the ones who are going to be saved by the grace of God. Because it talks at the end of verse uh, 35 there, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's the same shall save it. We'll be saved by the grace of God if Christ through faith is our top priority. Not through practice, but through priority. Because there are people through practice who put a top priority, or at least put a high priority, It wasn't top because self was still number one in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He said, not everyone that calls unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who are doing the will of God. And so it's faith. It's not by, you can't just holler out, Lord, Lord. A lot of people go to church on Sundays and they raise their arms and they sing hallelujahs and praise and they call it worship. Worship comes from the heart. It's not an exercise of entertainment Uh, Worship is that which comes from a heart that is truly sold out, surrendered, and submitted wholly to God through faith in Jesus Christ. But those that would come after me, according to the scripture here, are those that have placed a number one priority on pursuing Christ. Because after me means just that, pursuit. It's a pursuit. I remember when... I undertook my studies uh, and, and, and I first attended college. I was pursuing an engineering degree. Well, I gave up on that. <clears throat> and then later, I changed my majors, got back in school, and then I pursued a psychology degree. And I pursued it enough that I did everything that I needed to do in order to get my diploma. Did everything I needed to do. And then... I wasn't satisfied. I wanted to go get more education, so I pursued another degree. And I went after that. It was a priority. It was all before I got saved by the grace of God, but I pursued it. What are we, what are we really pursuing? What, if, if, what in our life? And I'm not talking about what our thoughts are right now in the context of what we're talking about, but on a regular, daily, average day basis... What are we pursuing? And it comes up in the next phrase. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. To deny means to disown yourself. Disown yourself. 
Wow. What a term. That's literally what it means. Disown yourself. And we have to do that in our hearts and our minds. We understand from 1 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 6, uh, and we can turn over there. I think it'll be a good, a good time to do that. 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 6, and we talk about this often, but let's go take a look at it. We understand the power is in the Word, right? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Look at verse 19. And what is the first word? What? What? Don't you know? Paul addresses that. Why does Paul address the Corinthians this way? Because back in chapter 3, he says, you're you're hard of understanding. You're hard to hear and to understand what I'm saying because you're carnal. You still have, these are believers. These were the saints at Corinth. But he was telling them, because you're still trying to live like the world, you have a hard time digesting the word of God. So here he says, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Your body. What is our body? It's a temple. It's a tabernacle of God. God lives within our body. The scriptures tell us that Christ lives in us. If we've been born again, we understand that the Holy Spirit's given to us and dwells within us from the moment of salvation until the Lord takes us home. God lives within the tabernacle we call our body. God's living there. You know, sometimes we say, you know, we got the WWJD folks and say, well, what would Jesus do? Right. Well, and and that's a very good question, because that's where we ought to be. What would Jesus do? Well, we know what Jesus would do, because what did Jesus say? I came not to do mine own will, but the will of my father who sent me. That's all we got to know about what would Jesus do, (laughs) because he's going to do the father's will. And he did every moment of every day. He was perfect. So he is our example. We are to follow him. We're to be imitators of God according to Ephesians 5.1. We're to imitate him. We're to be followers of God as dear children. So we want to perform the Father's will just like Jesus did. And so he talks to these believers at Corinth. Says, Don't you know what your body is? It's a dwelling place for God himself. And so he says... Whom you have of God, and you are not your own. You are not your own. Why do we live our lives as if our body is our own? We do. Why do we do that? What would Jesus do? Uh, He would live as if his body is not his own. Right? Because he came to do the Father's will. Not to do the self-will. Not to be self-centered. Jesus could never be accused of being self-centered, selfish, and it's all about me. It was never about him. Never about him. It's always about pleasing the Father and doing his will. And it tells us why our body is not our own. In verse 20, for you are bought with a price. The price of Christ's blood. We were purchased. We are a purchased possession of God. And God has come in and set up household. Who are we to selfishly live our life to satisfy our own will and desires? No, we can't do that. So the first point we're making here is we need to diligently pursue Christ. Diligently. Diligently means to make every effort possible to do something. To make every effort possible to do something. So the only way to do that, because see, we're always drawn in our natural mind, our natural state, into doing things to satisfy, guess who? Not God, but ourselves. That's how we naturally would live. That's our will. That's our desires. Jesus said, I came not to do my own will, I mean, why else would Jesus, being God himself, go to the cross? Only to perform the will of God. Because he was God himself anyway. 
But he was still living in the flesh and suffered all the same temptations and all the same hardships and all the same sufferings that we do. So we have to pursue Christ with a passion. We have to go after him. And, and this, this come after me talks about a continuous process of pursuing Christ. It's a, and that's the tense of the verb in the Greek. It's a continuous process. Keep on pursuing Christ. If anyone is going to come after me, whosoever comes after me, whosoever comes after me. You know, I, and I was drawn as I was studying this <clears throat> because if we're going to pursue, diligently pursue Christ, uh, it's, it's not just, it's a commitment. It's a commitment because when we come to faith in Christ and we tell the Lord, I put my faith in Christ. If it's genuine, it's a commitment. It's a commitment because it's something that we're never going to turn back from. That's what saving faith is. You say, well, people got saved and they got lost. No, they didn't get lost. They weren't saved to start with. That's the problem. Because words are cheap. Anybody can come into church, get emotional about a message, come down to the altar and leave, and then just live like the world. They say, well, I made a profession of faith 38 years ago. It doesn't matter. What matters is faith without works is dead. So the faith that's expressed in a profession of faith, if there's nothing to demonstrate that we're actually living our life because we now want to pursue Christ. If anyone will come after me, we need to, we need to pursue him. And it's a commitment. And I think, and I, and I did a little research on it, but there's this phrase that still gets all over me. I keep bringing it up. Maybe I should apologize for it, but I'm not. And that is the, the theme of a lot of modern churches is to connect others with Jesus and to connect people with Jesus and others, to connect them. I did a little research. I started looking at some churches and their mission statements, and, and, the, and the several of them that I did, all of the mission statements include this. This is what it's about. And it's about not trying to attract people to the church, but it's trying to attract people to yourself. Attract people to yourself. Because if you're, if you're a Christian, you truly have put faith in the Lord, you want to attract people to yourself so that they can see what your relationship is with God, and then they'll want the same thing. Well, there's really nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, it's, it's called being a witness. But somehow this connecting people with Jesus is about, um, it, it's like if you have if you have more than one room in your house, they're typically connected by a hallway. There's a connection there. And all of this stuff that's talked about connecting people to Jesus and to others is trying to get all, all of these people connected to each other, and then they attend the church, and so they're connected together, and it's all about building connections with people and hopes that they will come and be connected to Jesus. Well, we don't get connected to Jesus. Uh, what we have to do is put faith in Christ. We have to trust him. We have to have confidence in him. We have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Then, then God saves us. What people want to do is they want to establish the connection, hoping that they'll get saved. <laughs> so they're connecting and, and every one of these churches I looked at, their priority is upon all of these small groups and individuals getting people to connect with them. And the connecting to Jesus is just a phrase that I, I haven't seen the word connect. In fact, I googled the word connect in the Bible. It doesn't show up. I've looked at my, my biblical encyclopedia. I don't see the word connect in the scriptures. The process is called faith. Faith. We can't connect with Jesus because it's like building a network. If you want to connect with somebody else, you find a way to get in touch with them. No, we have to surrender. 
It's not a connection. It's a surrender. Because a connection is, is something that is, it, it joins together. And that's what most churches will talk about in connecting people to others. They talk about verses in the Bible that talk about being in unity one with another. And how, how the, the joints supply, if you will, that wherewithal to function as a body of Christ. But we don't connect with Jesus. We have to commit to Jesus. Commit in faith. We have to turn from sin and put our faith in Christ. And it needs to be a once and for all surrender. It's not just thinking about it. It's just not, it's a good thing to do now. It's a full surrender. We turn from sin and we surrender to the Lord. That is saving faith. We have to commit. And if we're going to diligently pursue Christ, we have to commit ourselves to Him. And I put the word diligently in there. I said it means to, to make every effort possible to do it. But here are some synonyms of this word diligent. And I just, and they all have the same kind of focus, and that is to persevere. In pursuing Christ. It's a continuous process. Be zealous about it. Be serious about it. Be enthusiastic about it, if you will. And uh, to be earnest in our pursuit of Christ. And that's what we need to do. So we go back to our text. We want to diligently pursue Christ. And we, we touched on the second point. <clears throat> and if we have the right priorities. We're going to deny ourselves. We have to deny ourselves. The scripture says in Mark 8, 34, whosoever will come after me, let him, the word let is a command, deny himself. You say, well, what am I going to, I'm going to deny myself an hour on Sunday morning and I'm going to go to church. No. Deny self-desires, self-will. Deny. Disown it. We have to disown ourselves. The problem is we think too highly of ourselves, a phrase that's used by Paul over in the book of Romans. We ought not to think too highly of ourselves. We ought to understand that this tabernacle that we have, this body, is a temple of the Lord. And we're no longer our own. God purchased this temple with the price of Christ's blood. We surrendered ourselves, and so now this belongs to Him. It's to be used for his purposes. It's to be used for his glory. It's to be used to witness and testify and tell others. It's to be used to grow in wisdom and strength. And to grow in enthusiasm, if you will, for the Lord. To praise him. To sing about him. To talk about him in everything we do. Literally, to refuse any association or companionship with self. <laughs> we disown ourselves. What happens in a family, and we're more familiar with the phrase or the word disown in a family setting. <clears throat> I've heard people say that, <clears throat> and I don't, I don't know, but I've heard it many times. I tend to believe it that there are many times in the Jewish family that when a Jewish person uh, <clears throat> gets saved by the grace of God, we call them Messianic Jews, right? Because the Messiah they put their faith in, that's Christ himself, that when they get saved, their family disowns them. And when they disown them, they remove all evidence of them from the family. They, they, they never existed in the family. That's what they do when they disown them. It's like they never existed. Who are you talking about if asked about that person? I don't know who you're talking about. They disown them. That's how severe the separation is because they have denied their Jewish religion. And so... Disown them. And, and, um, I mean, typically, uh, just take an, an average family, there are children that get so bad. Maybe they go out and commit horrendous crime. Maybe they go out and commit a rape. Maybe they murder somebody. Who knows what it might be? Maybe they just antagonistic towards their family, and families come to the point where they get fed up with them, and they disown them. You've heard of Maybe it's happened in your family. I don't know. But they disown them. They disown a family member. It means they shut them out. Gone. That's the word used here. If any, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Disown yourself. Because see, it's never about us. I've closed many of my messages on Facebook when I put them out there. It's always about Christ. It's never about us. And it is never about us. 
Because it's not about what we want. It's not about what we desire. It's not about what is important to us by way of self-interest. But it's all about what does the Lord want. Jesus said, as our example, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. We studied that phrase several times in the the Gospel of John as we studied here verse by verse from beginning to end. I came to do my Father's will. We're the same. We abandon a life of sin. We turn from that. And to faith in Christ, when we do that, it's total surrender and we disown that person, whoever it was. We become a new creation in Christ Jesus. The scripture tells us we're a new creation. And God now lives within us. And this creation that God has made as we've been born again is that which is to be used to glorify the Father. That's what Christ did. What would Jesus do? He would glorify the Father. Every step. And he did. And he did. And you say, well, he didn't have any fun. Well, sure he had fun. Well, he didn't have a life. Sure he had a life. We just had the wrong perspective. It's sort of like Lot's wife. When God delivered the family out of Sodom and Gomorrah, she looked back because she was still interested in what was there in her past. We can't be still interested in our past. We can't do it. It doesn't matter how important those things were to us. It doesn't matter. Our first and top priority is God and serving Him. And the Scripture talks about that. We've talked about it many times. Even because, and I believe that Jesus used the example because we consider our family as being, because people say, well, what are your top priorities? God, family, and in church. Well, God is number one. That's right. They got it right. Family second, that's right. But what happens is they know that's the right answer. But in practice, they flip it many times because having peace in the family is more important than dividing the family with the position in Scripture. So we flip the equation, make family first. God, you're coming in second place in this area because I'm going to keep my family together, whatever. No, not whatever. It's commendable to keep your family together and have a nice loving family. But just because a person saved by the grace of God in a family is a mom or dad or a son or a daughter doesn't mean everybody else in the family is going to feel the same way. It doesn't mean that. And if we're given top priority to God and we're living in a family, God has to be our top priority as we live in the family. And so the decisions we make and the things we say and the things we choose to do, we cannot participate in worldly things. And there are people who will go do things because they are going to enjoy time with the family. You can't can't abandon your priority on God to go do a priority on the family. And and, And I use the family as an example because that's the one thing that usually comes first over God in practicality for many people. Career is another thing. Workaholics. Most workaholics are proud of being a workaholic. That's why they're workaholics. They're proud of it. They're proud of it. I've worked with many of them. They, they want to, you know, they're, they, they want to get there. They want to get to the top. It's a priority in their life. And it's like work is work. We need to work. We need to earn a living. So they're not an infidel, but we're, we're, we're providing for our family. The problem is that people get so wrapped up in their work, they abandon their family. So <clears throat> for a lot of folks, it's work first, family second, and then God comes there somewhere down the line. Self usually gets up to the top of the ladder. Anything, anything that replaces God as number one priority is based on our self-interest. That's why we have to deny ourselves. If we're truly going to pursue Christ um, as a top priority, we have to disown ourselves. We have to. So then thirdly, um, uh, we've got to be cross bearers. It says, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So as a third item for today's study, I put decisive submission to Christ. When a, when a criminal in Rome had to, uh, was going to be crucified, what they would do 
is they would make that person bear a part of the cross uh, uh, for the crucifixion. And that's what happened to Jesus, right? They had to bear a part of the cross. But in the, in the typical Roman culture, when they did that, what is signified to the Romans is complete submission to Roman authority. Complete submission to Roman authority. Because they were now under, under the load of the cross, which represented the authority, and they're now under that. But as Christians, we are to take up our cross, not through forced submission, voluntarily. We're to take up our cross and follow Him. We've got to say no to self. We've got to say yes to God. The problem is what this kind of effort does is it puts us self out there uh, vulnerable to a world because what this really talks about is willing to suffer for Christ. Willing to suffer for Christ. We have to be willing to do that. What is it Paul talks about the fellowship of Christ's sufferings? That I could participate in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. We need to participate in Christ's suffering. What does that mean? Okay, well, in the 38th verse, it says, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with holy angels. So whosoever is ashamed of me and my words, ashamed of me and my words, So we get into certain circles. In fact, for many believers, I think it's kind of routine not to, uh, not to, or to feel some kind of shame in order to bring up the name of Jesus wherever they go. Why don't we talk about Jesus like we talk about the weather? Shame. Shame. Because we know, maybe it's fear of being ostracized. People don't want to hang out with us anymore. Uh, but, you know, we should, we should freely talk about. We want people to know who we know. You've got to talk about them. If, if you love your wife, men, you're going to talk about your wife. If you love her, you're going to talk about her. You're going to brag on her. You're going to, you're going to mention how good the Lord was in giving her to us, right? It's, it's my wife. I love her. I'm going to talk about her. Life the same way. If, you're, if, you, if, if you really love your husband, you're going to talk about him. Uh, we really love Jesus, but, oh, to bring his name up all the time just doesn't fit my lifestyle. Can't do that. And we sort of enjoy some of the restrictions that are made. Like you can't talk about Jesus at the workplace. Whew, got out of that. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Maybe you felt an obligation and they weren't performing it and now you can't do it. Great. Can't take your Bible to work? Great. Because there are certain areas of our life where we want to hide Christ. We don't want him out front as obvious. We don't want people to know. Because somebody, somebody goes like the, the one man said to me, he says, yeah, the, the Bible is just fiction. So the next time you talk to somebody, why would you want to bring the Bible up? They may, they may react the same way. So fear of what others may say, fear of what others may think. We need to take up our cross, bear it on our back, and go through the world not as a brave warrior so much, as a submissive child of God saying, look who my Lord is. Look who I serve. But unfortunately, in so many areas of our life, we don't want other people to know that we're serving somebody else. Because the vast majority of our friends and family, they don't want anything to do with the Lord. They don't want you to talk about the Lord. They don't want anything to be brought up about how their life has sin in it and what they might be doing is sin. But you know what? We, according to Matthew 5 and the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He says, you are the light of the world. You need to let that light shine. Don't put a lampshade on it. We're too busy putting lampshade on our light. We're trying to draw this thing down and hide from people. 
the fact that we love the Lord. We can't be ashamed of Him. We have to, in, in, in verse 35, whoever would save his life, whoever will save his life, we say it, we try to protect ourselves from poverty, from persecution, from pain and suffering, and any kind of perceived risk. <clears throat> We're just about saving our life, saving our reputation. Jesus made himself of no reputation. The Jewish authorities, uh, the Jewish religious authorities, all those self righteous Pharisees, they accused Jesus of lying and being a son of Beelzebub. Because he claimed to be the king that was promised. He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the Lord. He claimed to be God himself. And he was. Did he clam up because they were going to kill him? Absolutely not. He kept talking about it. We shouldn't react adversely. Or cow down because somebody in our circle of friends. You know what? We don't need friends like that. They're really enemies of the cross. They're enemies of the cross. That's why Ephesians 5 tells us not to fellowship and be partakers in their things, their deeds, their sins. So, what shall a prophet a man in verse 36? <clears throat> uh, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Remember, Jesus started out saying, Whosoever shall come after me. I wonder how many fake confessions or professions of faith there might be. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. But one thing I know is if we're going to go after Christ, if we're going to diligently pursue Him, we've got to disown ourselves <clears throat> and we've got to decisively submit to Christ. We've got to be determined that we're going to live a life in subjection and submission and surrender to Christ. So we ask ourselves this question. How much of my life do I not surrender to Christ in? I'm not bearing the cross. I'm not a cross bearer. I want to close. Look at Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 32. We'll close over there. Matthew 10, verse 32. <clears throat> There's a word used twice in this 32nd verse called confess. <clears throat> we need to understand that word before we can understand the verse. Because if we just use our natural mind to think about what that word confess means, it won't have the full import and impact that we need in this verse. But to confess as it's used here, because it's not a word that's often used for confess in the scriptures, in the New Testament. But this word confess, we might, we might want to, and, and some people do, just call it acknowledging. But it's acknowledging unashamedly, unashamedly. A real definition of this word is to declare openly. If we're going to confess, according to verse 32, means we're going to declare openly by way of speaking out freely from a deep conviction of facts. To declare openly, that means without reservation, unashamedly, declare openly by way of speaking out freely. Freely means we're not concerned about what other people think or what other people say or how other people are going to react. We're going to speak freely and openly from a deep conviction of facts. That's truth. So the verse says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. Whoa. That is, whosoever will declare openly by way of speaking out freely from a deep conviction of facts about Christ... Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father who is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And then that passage, think not that I came to bring peace. But look at verse 37, because we're talking today about priorities. Matthew 10, 37. <clears throat> There's a phrase used here, more than me. Let's pay attention to that. Let's take it to heart. 
Let's meditate on that and come back to it later in the day, rest of the week, next week, next month, etc. In verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me. It's not what we would say. It's what we do. It's what we do. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We're not worthy of the Lord. If we love anybody more than we love Christ. More than me, he said. So what is it that we prefer more than Christ? Not what we would say, because we know what the right answer is. We know the right answer. It's all about how we're living and applying the Word of God. How are we living this Word? <clears throat> that wherever we go, is there any priority that's more than Christ? Does our life demonstrate that? And what we have to do, we have to do what it says in 2 Corinthians 11. It says, uh, what we have to do is we have to examine ourselves examine ourselves we have to to see whether or not we'd be in the faith because there's a lot of folks in Matthew 7 21 that are confessing the Lord they're saying Lord Lord I've done all these great and wonderful things and Christ says I never knew you depart from me you workers of iniquity there are a lot of people who know the right answers they can recite from memory verses of scripture they can talk about principles of scripture but what does their life reveal to God? And that's what we got to look at. What does our life reveal to God? Are we denying the Lord before other people? Or are we speaking openly and freely from deep conviction of truth in God's Word? Because, you see, that's what Paul did in his missionary work. He spoke openly and freely with deep conviction. And that's why he was beaten left for dead, kicked out of synagogues, drugged by the heels, and suffered all kinds of things because he didn't deny the Lord. He confessed Him openly and freely because of this deep conviction. Do we have that deep conviction that, that motivates us to pursue Christ and deny ourselves? That's what we need. And we're going to continue to study through this topic about strengthening, if you will, our spiritual maturity. Because it's got to start at the foundation level, and this is where it is. It's just a basic truth. The first thing we have to do is we've got to pursue Christ and deny ourselves, And then everything else is going to flow correctly from that point, if we get that right. But we've got to get that right. Let's stand together for prayer, if you will. Father, we thank You for Your love, Your mercy, and Your grace. We thank You for Your Word. It's quick and powerful. It's alive. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces asunder bone and marrow. It even divides and discerns our thoughts and intents. Father, we, we can hide behind our actions, our true thoughts and intents to others, but not to You. Fathers, we leave here today, may it be with a full commitment, full commitment to diligently pursue Christ and to disown ourselves through denial of self-will and self-interest, self-centeredness. Father, may we be used to Your glory and to Your honor as we are truly Your tabernacle that You have taken over. Father, may Your will be ours in every aspect. And we'll give you praise and thanks for what You've done here today and for what You will continue to do in the days, weeks, and months, and years ahead. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.